the most interesting guests in the music industry, entertainment, art, and politics. Step into the studio for Turning Point with Frank McKay. And now, Turning Point with Frank McKay. Welcome to Turning Point. Our very special guest today is Jerry Trimble. Jerry is a, I was going to say martial artist, but you still call it kickboxing, Jerry, don't you? Uh, yeah, yeah. In the uh, MMA world, it's uh, striking. I'm a striker. You're a striker. Uh, two-time striker. champion. And, uh, and, and certainly uh, you've done quite a bit in acting, youth motivational speaking. And, uh, and you did some stunts way back when and, uh, and still from time to time. Jerry Trimble is our special guest. How are you? I'm doing great, Frank, and I want to thank you so much for having me on the show. It's an honor, sir, and I'm a big fan. Yeah, we're th thrilled to have you. Thank uh, you. So you, you mentioned kickboxing. I, I, you know, you hardly ever hear the term kickboxing anymore. It's usually uh, it, it's usually laid out as MMA or uh, ultimate fighting. Um, you know, the, the term kickboxing, uh, is anybody still using it? Uh, yeah, you, there's different styles of the martial arts. There's kickboxing, there's Muay Thai, there's Taekwondo, there's karate, there's, I believe there's over thousands, uh, a little under a couple of thousand different styles of the martial arts. And uh, kickboxing is just, you know, it, it's a combination of Taekwondo and boxing is basically what it is. The style that I did of kickboxing, my base style was Taekwondo. It's a Korean art. Did you first get interested in the martial arts? Oh, God, well... Back in the day when I was a kid, I was uh, I was bullied quite a bit, and um, I was bullied. I was humiliated. Uh, my biggest thing of going to school was being embarrassed, and fear was a big part of my life. And I remember about the age of I don't know, 13 or something, I went to snuck in to see a rated R movie. It was called The Chinese Connection with Bruce Lee, and then. Boom! Changed my life. Got into martial arts, and uh, well, the rest is history. But uh, it was it was absolutely all inspiring to see this man on the screen and to see him do what he did. And you know, and, and being a kid that was picked on every day at school, I said, I got to do that. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah, well, no question about it. Especially for a guy that uh, you know is coming from that world of getting getting bullied. Do you think things? With the awareness campaign that's going on on bullying, do you think things are better now than they were when you were a kid? I think they're worse now uh, than when I was a kid. See, back in the day, it was, you know, being bullied, it was, you know, it, it, there were fair fights. There wasn't guns pulled out. There wasn't, you know, weapons that there are now. Uh, the kids nowadays uh, that are being bullied, I mean, they're taking it to a whole new level, especially with all the social media, uh, you know, stuff going on. It's 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 pretty scary. It's a scary time right now. You know, that's why I've, I've decided to, you know, I, I've been speaking to kids God, ever since I, became a I think a blue belt, green belt or blue belt. I started doing demonstrations in front of the schools that I was going to. And um, that's when I got hooked to, you know, really change and inspire kids to believe in themselves and to go after their dreams. And that's what I did. And, um, you know, that, that that's what the, the kids, they need to find some identity in themselves. And that's what I did through the martial arts. Thank God I got into it because I'd probably still be back in Kentucky yeah. working in a warehouse. <laughs> Well, our very special guest today, if you're just tuning in, is Jerry Trimble, and he is a youth motivational speaker and a two-time champion, kickboxing champion. Uh, let's go back to Kentucky for okay. uh, for a moment. Um, certainly, the southern uh, the southern states, and you know, a lot of. Um, maybe it's a stereotype, but southern states and, and Kentucky, I'd put in that category, have a reputation for being really, really rough on uh, on folks, and especially if you're from other parts of the state. Did you find that to be the case in Kentucky? Well, you know, it, it's funny. Uh, I, you know, when I was bullied, it was, you know, I mean, I was bull I was a specific case. I had. I had a bad complexion. I had cold sores that would cover my top and bottom lips. I was called canker lips. I was called pizza face. I looked like I had a bowl over my head. These kids just, I don't know, they kind of lashed out at me. And, and, you know, they right now, I think the statistics are there's 160,000 kids that take off of school every day for fear of being bullied. And I was one of those kids. Um, you know, the, the, there was a specific amount of kids that, in order to fit in, you had to be a job 
doc, you had to be somebody extremely intelligent that was uh, running for class president. And I was neither of those, so I, you know, I had to do something about it. And I, I thought, you know what? How can I end this bullying reign that's you know, come up on me? And what I did was I tried to join an athletic team. I thought, you know what? If I join a sports team, I could be an athlete, and then I could have friends, and that didn't work. And I went from a swim team, I quit, and then I went from a, uh, what was it, a, um, a basketball team, then I quit, then I went to a football team, then I quit, and I kept quitting, and then I found Bruce Lee, and Bruce Lee inspired me. Back in the day, you know, I, I think bullying's a lot tougher to, uh, right now than it is back in the day. And, you know, from where I w was in Kentucky, I really don't know how, if it was worse in the South or the Midwest where I was from, or it was worse, you know, on the East Coast or West Coast. I don't know. You know, I just, you know, I was a kid back in the day. So all I know is, you know, I was bullied all the time and it was a, it was, it was a pain in the ass. <laughs> what, what was, what was the, the, the um, uh, geography like? In uh, Kentucky, were you in Louisville? Were you in the sticks? I was in it's. I was in uh, Newport, Kentucky. It was uh, right on the the uh, um, uh, right on the very tip of Kentucky, where they filmed KRP in Cincinnati, right on the border of Cincinnati and, and uh, Kentucky, Ohio and Kentucky, Cincinnati, Ohio. That was the big state. That was the big city, right where I was from. Yeah, KRP in Cincinnati. Yeah, uh, you know the. I think the Cincinnati airport is actually in Kentucky. Is in Kentucky. Yeah, it's, it's the Greater Cincinnati Airport. It's actually in Erlanger, Kentucky. Uh, I don't know. I don't get it. <laughs> How about the the teachers at that point? Did you try to reach out, or did you kind of just you know suffer in silence? Well, you, you know what? Yeah, I, I pretty much suffered in silence. I was a, I was a loner. I um, you know um, I remember one teacher specifically that really tried to reach out to me and um, Mr. Vetus, and he was the greatest teacher I ever had. And you know what? I just I kind of shied away from all the teachers. Um, he was the only one that I that sticks out of my head that I remember back in the day. Uh, the t you know it was I don't know it was the teachers they they did their deal and and that was pretty much it. Now the other the students, the popular students, you know, they had a rapport with the teachers, which, you know, I saw and, you know, it was fine, but I just kind of sunk back into my own little world. And then I, you know, tried to figure out a plan and that's, you know, the, the plan was to join athletic teams and that didn't work. So Bruce Lee came about. So, yeah. so you see Bruce Lee, uh, it, was there a, a, a local karate school? Was there a local judo school or something? <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny because uh, when I uh, when I saw Chinese Connection, um, I was going home and trying to figure out a way to ask my mom and dad if I can join a martial arts studio. <clears throat> and um, they laughed at me, said, "Yeah, now you're not going to join karate." So I broke open my piggy bank, and I was about, I guess, about 12, 12, 12 13 years old. Took all the money I had, which is about maybe nine bucks, and I go to the magazine store and I bought up every single magazine that I could find on martial arts. And then, living on the third floor, uh, our, our, our bedroom, my brother and I, bedroom was on the third floor. So I took all the magazines and I spread them throughout the entire room, and I had them. Sp they were all over the. It was it was a mess, and I would practice and practice. And my mom would come up and say, "What the hell are you doing?" And I'm like, "Mom, no, I'm just practicing." So that went on for about, I don't know, maybe four months, but I was so consistent and I found something that I was drawn to. And and that's what kids, I think, need to find. They need to find something that they're really drawn to, something that they're attracted to, that they can really dive in and they can find their identity through. So I did that for about four or five, six months. And then um, I remember at the time there were no karate schools in the area. The nearest one was in Covington, Kentucky, which was across the river, across the bridge. And then my uncle, um, God bless him, he he's a uh, naval practitioner uh, of Kung Fu, and he came over to the house one day and said that there was a karate school that just opened up like about five, no, five minutes. It was, uh, we were on Third Street, so it was about, about two miles from us. <clears throat> and uh, he asked my mom and dad, he said, listen, he said, there's a Taekwondo school. He says, let me enroll Jerry into it. Because they, she had, my mom and dad had told my uncle how much I was going nuts on this martial arts kick. And, um, yeah, so uh, he took me down, and I enrolled in it. And I walked to the school every sing six days a week, two or a two-mile walk. 
and uh, and just I dove into it head first, one hundred and twenty five thousand percent. It was just incredible. Yeah. Jerry, Jerry Trimble is a two time kickboxing champion, and we're talking to him about youth mo- motivation and getting uh, getting beyond the bullying problem and his life and, and his career. Jerry Trimble is our special guest. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. Jerry Trimble is our special guest. Jerry, what's the first thing you say to a kid when you find out that he's being bullied? What's the first thing that you do as a parent, as an adult? I, 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 I for, as, as, a, as, as an adult, what I try to do is I try to get down to their, under their level. You get onto their level and you try to talk to them like you're one of them, like you're a pal. And you start questioning them. You start asking them questions. What would they do if they couldn't fail? You know, you try, try to get them to understand that, as Dr. Seuss said it perfectly, why fit in when you were meant to stand out? And you, try, you know, you got to get to know these kids. You got to really get to know them. You got to be a pal. You got to be a friend. You got to communicate with them. You can't talk down to them. You can't talk to them like a teacher. And another thing, the parents, they need to get more involved with these kids you know i mean i've talked to parents and i'm like so so what is what is billy i mean what are his hobbies oh he's just he goes to school and he comes back and then he gets on the computer and he does this and they're talking in a way that they're really not knowing what their kids are doing and when you know i mean i've been working with at-risk kids it's funny at-risk kids i really connect with more than a, a, a kid that comes from a great family and he's got straight a's and everything going on with him, and I think it's come coming from the uh, point of view of that, you know, of being me being bullied and and my fighting background. And I, you know, I used to get a lot of street fights once I get into the martial arts, and I think it was stems from all the, you know, all the past rage that I had from being bullied. So I talk to these kids, and I get on their level. They they kind of communicate with me, and and you know I'm, I'm trying to find out what they want to do with their life. I ask them, I, and I ask the kids and the adults this, and some of your listeners think about this question: What would you do if it was impossible for you to fail? If whatever higher power you believe in came up to you and said, Billy, Johnny, Joe, Susie, it's impossible for you to fail. What would you attempt to do? And it has to feel natural. It has to be something that feels really natural. And I even ask adults this, and people that are in their 50s and 60s, I'm going, do you wake up every day going to work going, I love my job? And they go, hell no. And these kids, they need to figure out what they want to do. You know, I mean, they're all every, – I think everybody on this planet is meant to stand out. They're not meant to fit in. You know, it's, 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 it's crazy. So when you get on the level of these kids and you start talking to them, you find out what they want to do. You get excited for what they want to do, and then you find a way to help them to do what they want to do. There needs to be some social interaction with these kids a lot more than there is right now. And then it's, it's I don't know, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a scary time now. It, our, it really is. Our very special guest is Jerry Trimble. He's a youth motivational speaker, two-time champion of uh, kickboxing world, an actor, former stuntman, current everything, a little bit of everything, <laughs> Jerry. I, let's go back to being 12 okay. years old. You're getting bullied. You, right. get, you get into a program. Um, you, you, know, you break open your piggy bank. Between that point when you decided yeah. and when did you really start either having the confidence or having the skills for that matter to defend yourself? And when did things kind of turn around a little? Um, well, when I got into martial arts, I, I, I put, you know, 150% into it. I went six days a week, walked every day. My dad took me home. Uh, my, thank God my mom and dad had a little cash, and they started uh, entering me into martial arts tournaments. And at this time, when I, when I first started the martial arts as a white belt, yellow belt, green belt, I was still getting picked on and bullied and name-calling. And then I remember walking out of the karate school I'd walk out every day with my belt on, and I'd look to the left, and I'd see all the bullies hanging out down at the block, and they were at the bowling alley. And it was so weird that these, you know, they'd sit there and they'd smirk at me, and then 
there was one specific time when I was a, I think it was a red belt, which is right next to black belt. There was this, the biggest guy in, in school. He was a football player. His name was Mark. We're in the locker room. He comes up to me and he says, you think you know martial arts? You think you know karate? This karate ain't going to do shit for you. So he starts getting in my face. All the kids are around. And I was just, I was, I didn't know what to do. And I'm like, so I visualized hitting him and the groin, hitting him in the face. And then the next thing I knew, I don't know what happened, but I was on the floor. He was on top of me with his feet. I was kicking him up against the locker. The teachers came up. They broke it up. He never messed with me again. Nobody else bullied me in school. And then once I turned as a black belt, I started doing demonstrations in the schools that everybody saw what I had done, and they were like, wow. And then from then on out, bullying became a thing of the past. How, how long did it take you to get your black belt? It took me about a year and a half, 18 months. And, and, and you know, everybody's like, well, that's, well, that's pretty quick. And you know what? It's funny. Nowadays, you can buy a black belt yeah. if you pay for a certain course. But I studied six days a week, and I would go. It was funny because in my uh, I did DECA, which is um, I, I you had to take like a business program, and and you could you could go to school until eleven o'clock, I think it was, and then I went to the karate school after that, and I did that for my last uh, my sophomore and senior year, and uh, I was at the school from the time it opened at eleven a.m. to the time it closed at nine nine p.m. at night, and I. I mean, I, I, I dove into it so much, and then sparring was my big thing. So I sparred anybody and everybody that would go in the back room and spar with me. It was just, you know, you, get, what, you know it's, 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 anything in life, what you put into it is what you get out of it. Yeah. You know, and, and, and so many people give up on certain things when they're just ready to overcome that obstacle that's going to take them to another level. I, I tell my kids all the time, it's not how many years you've been doing something, it's how many hours you've been yes. doing something. And, and I think that's, a, that's an excellent story. Exactly. And yeah. So you, the rest of your high school years, you're thinking, hey, I'm going to do this professionally, I'm going to teach, or I'm going to what? Well, you know, it's, it's funny because once I got into it, it, my instructor, uh, Richard Hamilton, uh, he told me, he goes, he goes, Jerry, he's, let me tell you something. He goes, you've got a gift. He goes, when you teach kids, he goes, it's, it's really strange. He goes, you can bring yourself down to their level and communicate with them on a level that I've never seen another instructor do. So from that moment on, I went, wow, I want to be a karate instructor and I want to have my own school. And at the same time, I started fighting, then I became the number one um, junior black belt in the Midwest and one of the top fighters in the United States. And then I was sitting watching ESPN, watching two legends fight, Richard Jackson and Howard Jackson, not related. And um, I was like, oh, my God. So the, the, the uh, beginning fighting that I did in my career was uh, points, and, and, it's, and it's, like a, it's, it's like a game of tag, and you get close, and you can tap them lightly with your hands or feet, and you win trophies. But it was after I became you know, the number one guy, and I'm like, okay, wow, well, what's next? Okay, the, you know, there's something else. And then I think what it is is, is like when, when I joined the school, I put the energy out there, and I don't know if I put I, – I guess I put so much energy out there that the school opened up within two miles away, which was great. And then I put the energy out there, and then the next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in front of the TV watching ESPN, seeing these two guys fight, and then I said, I want to do that. I want to become world champion. And then that's when – it was like, you call them turning points, I call them plot points. It's like in the movies, you call them plot points that take you in a whole new direction. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and then, uh, and then I fought for the Kentucky State title in Kentucky and won that. And then my karate instructor moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and said, listen, I got a place opening up, and once you come down, you can fight. You can fight out of uh, Asa Gordon's stable and, uh, and go for the world title. And then, yeah, I packed up after I graduated high school cried and went, Mom, I'm, go I'm leaving home. I'm going to Atlanta. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a tough time. <laughs> what, what did your parents think of your, your decision to go into this full time once uh, you started You know, it's, it's, it's funny. In the beginning, my father was like, you know what? You need to get a job where they're going to give you benefits and you're going to have a steady job and, you know, and you got to look at the long term. And I said, well, Dad, I said, I'm, I'm good at this and I, I like doing it and I really enjoy it and it's a passion. 
And then, uh, so as, as time went on, he took me to the tournaments. And then as I started fighting in Atlanta, he would travel down. Everything changed, you know, and, and it's, uh, yeah, my mom was, she was for whatever I wanted to do. But, uh, yeah, my dad, you know, when I won the, after the Kentucky state title, I won the Georgia state title. And then things started changing, and I started getting a name in the in the kickboxing world. And uh, yeah, yeah it, they suddenly were 110 percent behind me. Jerry Trimble is our guest. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. Jerry Trimble is our guest. He's a two-time champion in kickboxing and motivational speaker and a little bit of acting, a little bit of uh, stunt work, a little bit of everything, uh, Jerry. And uh, uh, congratulations on what so far is an excellent career. Uh, a lot of martial artists need to, I don't know if they need to, but they gravitate towards the, the movies, right. or towards the film world, because it's it's a place actually to, to make a living. Mm -hmm. And is that... Uh, what motivated you to get towards uh, Hollywood? Yeah, well, you know, what? the funny thing is, when I was about 10 years old, I, I don't know, I got redirected somewhere. Uh, I, when I was about 10 years old, I would, I would write, I don't know, I, I, was, I would write movie ideas, and I would put all the actors that I would have star in the movie ideas. So I was kind of an up-and-coming filmmaker, I think, at, at like 10. And this yeah. was way before the martial arts. And then uh, my parents got me all these silent movies, and I, and I would take them up upstairs, and I'd start editing with a record player and a tape recorder. So I was doing something that I I come full circle to. But when I got into the uh, into the martial arts, I uh, when I won the Kentucky title, uh, Kentucky state title, I won the Georgia state title, the Southeast title, the U.S. title, then I won the world title, two world titles. <clears throat> there was a promoter that suddenly had taken the sport and and gave it something like Dana. White is doing with the MMA. His name was Jim Abernathy. He's he's uh, he's gone right now. Rest in peace. But um, he told I was his first uh, world champion that he signed. He signed four of us, and he says I'm going to take you, and I'm going to take you to California, and I'm going to put you in the movies. And I went. Wow. And then suddenly I remembered, oh, my God, when I was 10 years old, I was doing the movie stuff. And it was like, we, you know, we were it, we, it was it was wild. I had come full circle so that that had happened. And then um, uh, I opened up a school and then a karate school. And it got to the point where I said, you know what? I, this is not what I want to do. I need to go forward. So the movies and then it fell through with Jim Abernathy. Some problems came along. It all fell through and I was in a place where I, I was I started partying heavy I started hanging out with the wrong people and then funny thing is and here's another turning point I, I hitchhiked to Florida when my girlfriend was down in Lake Okeechobee and it was about 23 hours and I remember walking down the Florida turnpike at 3 o'clock in the morning hitchhiking mm. it's, uh, yeah, would I do it again would I encourage anybody to do it no but I remember thinking Somebody said, you know what, you got to be careful on the Florida Turnpike if you're hitchhiking because there's alligators down there. And I'm I'm walking, and, and I stop, and I hear something wrestling in the woods. It's a full moon. There's no cars in sight, and I'm thinking, oh, shit. And then and I, got a, I got a rusty old knife in my bag, and that's all I got. So I start running, and I start running, and I'll be damned. There's something in the woods, down in the woods, that's, that's following right alongside me. It was a little bit of ways down, but, but I could hear it. Yeah. And then after I got to a clearing and a rest area, I, it, it hit me, and I went, you got to go to California, and you got to be in the movies. And I went, and this is what Abernathy had talked about. And then when I got back to L.A., uh, or I'm sorry, back to Atlanta, Georgia, I was living with Glenn Hughes, the rocker from Deep Purple, Black Sabbath. Glenn and I were best friends, and okay. uh, I, I sold everything I had and moved to California. No kidding. Oh, that's interesting about Glenn Hughes. Uh, Glenn, not only a musician, but a producer. He, he does quite a bit also. He's a versatile guy. He's a, he's a fantastic human being. Yeah. Jerry Trimble's our guest. He's a two-time champion, as we mentioned, in martial arts or kickboxing, as he put it. And uh, he headed towards uh, California. Once you got to California, what was your first gig in the movies? Well, it's, it's funny. When I got there... Um I, 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 me and my buddy lived in a little guest house or a little garage, and we were partying again. And I said, "Whoa, what am I doing?" 
So I got off my rear end, looked in the yellow pages, and I found Chuck Norris Studio. Started teaching for Chuck Norris Studio. Found a manager that first day when I went in to audition for the class, for a teacher teacher's position. And uh, sent me on my first two auditions. One was with Jet Li, and the other was with Bolo Young. And it was two auditions, two lead roles as as, as the villain, and in, uh, in the same week. And you know, my my manager's like, dude, this never happens. Yeah. So then it took off, and I went, okay, now I see the direction I'm going in. The movies, the action, the yeah. So it, it just it, it 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 hit. It was a perfect fit. How about the stunt work that you've done? What what kind of stunt work have you done? Well, the stunt work it, it was funny. Stunts kind of found me. Um, after 9-11, things started to slow down for two years, and then I had a buddy of mine, Jesse Johnson, terrific director, told me, he says, my uncles, Vic and Andy Armstrong, are coordinating Charlie's Angels, the first Charlie's Angels. And he says, give me your reel and my action reel. And I said, okay, cool. So I gave them the action reel. They called me in. I met with uh, Vic and Andy, and uh, they cast me as um, uh, one of Sam Rockwell's villains for uh, the first Charlie's Angels. It was fantastic. It was six six weeks of work fighting Drew Barrymore. (laughs) It was great. It was, yeah, I was like, okay, this is too cool, yeah. and that was my that was my first stunt gig. But I've done most of the action films in the beginning. I did pretty much most of my own stunts. Everything but falling off of big buildings. Eh, eh, I don't like heights. Yeah. <laughs> how, how was it working with Drew Barrymore? She was cool. She was really cool. Yeah, she was. Uh, it was funny because we were doing a scene, and then uh, my control is really good. <laughs> We do an action scene, and it's me and four other guys in this scene. Uh, It was like in one of the finale scenes, and I threw a punch. I threw a right cross, and I touched her nose, like barely, just barely touched it. She's like, oh, my God, and she backs up, and she's she's hysterical, and she's in the chair, and I'm like, oh, my God. And everybody's looking at me like, oh, dude, you did it now. You broke Drew Barrymore's nose, and I went, I just touched her. And she, I think she kind of, it, it shocked her a little bit because it was just a touch. And then she looked up, and she's like, oh, well, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. And she was, she was, yeah, she was cool, and, uh, yeah, it was great, yeah. But I thought, oh, my God, my first dunk gig, and it's almost <laughs> over with now. Yeah. <laughs> From there, where, where do you get into motivational speaking? And for those who are just tuning in, Jerry Trimble is our guest. He's a motivational speaker. He's a two-time champion of, of kickboxing, an actor, stuntman. Uh, Jerry, how do you get into motivational speaking from there? Well, you know, it, it's funny because I've been doing it since about 1977, and I, um, you know, I, I've been you know doing the schools and and a lot of at-risk centers. I was just the last thing in LA was uh, working with the LAPD for like three years, their Jeopardy program. I just, you know, I was talking to my father-in-law, um, uh, Mickey Dolans, and he he said, you know what? I'm going to take you to lunch. I got an idea for you. And I'm like, okay, cool, cool. So we go out, and he said, listen, and he bring, he throws out a bunch of papers, and he says, I've been doing some research. He goes, I know you've been doing motivational speaking your whole life. He goes, but you need to take it as a business. He goes, you need to do it seriously and do it, you know, do it, do it in a different way than you've been doing it. Just volunteering, which is cool. I love volunteering. But uh, he encouraged me to, and this is another turning point. He encouraged me to take it to the next level. So what I've been doing is I've been I've been working on on on, you know, um, uh, he's uh, helped me with my logo. He's one of the biggest supporters I have. And, um, you know, we're getting it down now where I'm going to, you know, the elementary schools and, and, and the high schools and the colleges, uh, we're going to start hitting them this year, which is, it's just, yeah, it, you know what, my, my passion is acting. I, I love performing. But my purpose in life, I believe, is to inspire kids and is to help kids to understand that they can do whatever they want if they put their mind to it and they're given the right tools. Well, that, that leads me to my next question is, where do you go from here? You've done all of this. You've set the stage for something, you know, real big here. What's your, your next set of goals? My next set of goals is, it, it, what I do if I couldn't fail, is I'm working on it now. I want to, you know, and I'm still bettering myself, and, and this is, I think everyone on this planet can continually better themselves. I'm doing brain training. I've, I've gotten heavily into meditation right now. I want to teach kids about, you know, Know, brain training. I want to teach kids about meditation. I want to inspire kids. I want to do passionate roles, roles with some depth to the, to it. You know, the action roles are fun. They're 
enjoyable. The Hitman roles, you know, I mean, they're they're great. But uh, I I want to I want to do meaningful roles. I want to produce projects that are going to make a change in the world. You know, I want to I want to I want to make a difference in the world. I want to make a positive difference to so many children, and and that's that's where I'm headed right now. Jerry Trimble is our guest. Jerry, what what's a website that people could follow you on and kind of get an idea of where you're going? Okay, it's a www.jerrytrimble.com. J e r r y t r i m b l e. Let's just repeat it real okay. quick. www.jerrytrimble.com. Jerrytrimble.com. What else would you like to add, Jerry? You know what? Tell your listeners out there that you know that 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 are not going in the right direction. Ask yourself, what would you do if you couldn't fail? Do you wake up every morning going, God, I love my job. I love going to work. You know, they say success is doing something that you love so much you'll do it for free and then becoming so good at it that you get paid for it. That's what people need to start thinking about. You know, that's what they, they need to start thinking. What would I do if I couldn't fail? What would I do if I couldn't fail? Start the day out positive. Wake up and ask yourself, what am I grateful for today? And have faith in the big man upstairs. You know, you got to communicate with him like he's your best friend. You know, it, it's, it's, yeah, life is too short, you know? Life is too short. <laughs> Jerry Trimble. Jerry, words to live by. Jerry Trimble has been our special guest today. He is a two-time champion in kickboxing. He is a an actor, a youth motivational speaker, and he's just doing wonderful, wonderful work. Everybody should check him out. Jerry, one more time on the website. JerryTrimble.com Jerry, thank you very, very much for being our guest. You're a wonderful guest. Frank, God bless you. Thank you, brother. Create same, a wonderful day. Same here, Jerry. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. Our guest again has been Jerry Trimble. He's a wonderful guy, and everyone should check out his website. We've mentioned it a few times on the air here, and we hope you'll all check him out. A two-time champion in kickboxing. He's an actor, and most importantly, he's a youth motivational speaker. And everyone uh, should just make everyone aware who's being bullied or has anybody in that that age group that could uh, could possibly be bullied to check out this guy. He's really, he's on the right track. Thanks for tuning, and we'll see you next week on Turning Point. Turning Point with Frank McKay is brought to you by Herman Katz Congemi and Klein, Duffy and Duffy, Gold Coast Bank, Heartland Business Center, Morgan Stanley and Smith Barney of PC Wealth Management, and the Hagadone Little Village School in Seaford, New York. Turning Point with Frank McKay was produced by GVP Digital Media in Rockakama, New York. Executive producers Frank McKay and Harry Oates. Associate producers Kristen and John McKay. Audio and studio engineering Brittany Fergo and Francis Kazmarek. Hotel and accommodations provided by Ohika Castle Hotel and Estate in Huntington, New York. Transportation services provided by Mark of Elegance Limousine in Hophog, New York. Catering services provided by Chella Bagels of Selden, New York.